welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Senior Curator of Collections at Historic New England and one of the curators of Artful Stories. My co-curator is my friend and colleague, Peter Trippi. Peter is an art historian in New York City, editor-in-chief of Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine, and a specialist in late 19th century European art, making this a particularly good topic for him today. And in fact, he's largely responsible for organizing tonight's program. Uh, welcome, Peter. Thank you, good to be here. And of course, I'd like to thank and welcome our colleagues, Margareta Frederick and Christine Shepard, um, who join us today from Delaware and Florida, respectively. Um, Margareta is the Annette Woolard Provine Curator of the Bancroft Collection of Pre-Raphaelite Art at the Delaware Art Museum, um, one of the largest, finest uh, pre-Raphaelite collections in this country. She has worked with the museum's Bancroft Collection for more than 20 years, focusing in particular on women within the pre-Raphaelite circle. This includes broadening the scope of the per permanent collection and curating exhibitions representing women's presence in 19th century British art. With Jan Marsh, Margareta co-curated the first rep retrospective exhibition of the pre-Raphaelite painter Marie Spartali Stillman in, 19, in 2015, uh, as well as smaller exhibitions featuring Mae Morris and Barbara Botticin. Projects currently underway include an exhibition of the work of Evelyn and William de Morgan in the fall of 2022 with an accompanying book of essays published by Yale University Press. Margareta is also co-editing the collected letters of May and May Morris and Anna Mason. And Peter, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Nancy. I'd like to introduce Kristen Shepard, who is the executive director and CEO of the Museum of Fine Art, St. Petersburg, Florida. She started her career at Sotheby's Auction House in New York and London, where for 10 years, her work focused on strategic planning, new business ventures and finance, the business side of the art world. In 2008, Kristen joined the Whitney Museum of American Art as director of membership and annual giving, and later moved to Los Angeles in 2013 to accept a leadership position at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. She is the youngest and first female director of the Museum of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg, which holds the largest encyclopedic collection in the state of Florida. At George Washington University, Kristen's master's thesis was the first comprehensive study of the work of Marie Spartali Stillman, whose works she first got to know almost 30 years ago when she visited the Delaware Art Museum. So this is truly coming full circle. Welcome, Kristen. Welcome, Margareta. Thank you. It's great to be here. And Peter, if you could forward the slide, please. Absolutely. So the exhibition that uh, is bringing us together for tonight's program is called Artful Stories. It's on view at the Eustace Estate, which is the architect Richard Morris Hunt's tour de force of aesthetic design and the most recent historic home to enter historic New England's collection of 37 historic properties. For those of you who have not been there, I highly encourage you to visit the house and the exhibition are open to the public on weekends with pandemic protocols in place. Next, Peter. Built for the Eustace family in 1879 and lived in there by three subsequent generations until it came to us in 2014, uh, the Eustace estate, as I said, is a tour de force. While all the rooms in the first floor, as well as one of the bedrooms on the second floor, have been restored to reflect the late 19th century taste of aesthetically minded Bostonians, four of the bedrooms have been transformed into galleries. And that's what you see. Uh, that's where you can see the current exhibition. Here you see two of the galleries. On the left is the introductory gallery called Land and Sea which introduces visitors to the region's landscape and connection to the sea. On the right is an image of the fourth gallery, The Wide World, which is about New Englanders' connections to places outside of the region. And this is where we'll be focusing our discussions today. And next, Peter. 
So um, Peter has rightfully pointed out that this is a particularly good slide to show you as part of this series of conversations because it's one of the early conversations between Peter and me overlooking uh, a few of the paintings at the conservation lab where they were being, being treated in advance of the exhibition. Um, you can see a couple of images that are in the uh, land and sea uh, section, but not any of the ones that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, Peter, next. Um, and while he and I, I think, take credit for which paintings are on view in the exhibition, the reason they look as wonderful as they do is because of the amazing work of our conservators and collections technicians. Here on the right, you see Historic New England's object conservator, Michaela Nero, who is an amazing talent and who we're incredibly lucky to have on staff. She's been with us for 20 years. Um, and on the left is our contract paintings conservator, Lisa Malin, who evaluated every painting in the exhibition and worked on many of them. Um, and now let me turn things over to Peter. Thank you, Nancy. Well, I thought it might be helpful before we begin our discussion with our guests to set some things in context. I think it's useful to talk about the Marie Spartali Stillman picture in the context of the exhibition, the gallery in which it hangs, and then also a little bit of historical background, if I may. Um, Nancy mentioned already Gallery 4, which is devoted to the wide world. And the theme, as you can see here on the label, has very much to do with the very complicated and interesting relationships between the region of New England and the world beyond. Uh, and sometimes that could be as simple as going over to upstate New York to see Niagara Falls, and sometimes it's as complicated as going to Macau, which you see depicted here in the mid-19th century at the top of this slide. Uh, on the right at the bottom, you see a wonderful image of Venice made in the early 20th century by Herman Dudley Murphy of Massachusetts, and the image that you see at the far left is actually um, Longfellow, uh, the painter, um, who is in his gorgeous studio in Massachusetts uh, showing off uh, works of art that he made abroad. So you get the idea of artists out in the world um, and, and in interconnections uh, with New England. Um, it makes sense then to hang this picture by Marie Stillman, uh, who was um, brought up in London uh, in this exhibition. And we're going to talk a lot about this picture today. Uh, I'm just showing you here uh, the image in its wonderful frame uh, which is very appropriate to the period. Uh, also, just if I may, uh, stressing the title, Hera, which we will discuss, uh, that is the name of the Greek goddess, uh, married to Zeus. Um, notice the life dates, please, of Marie Spartali Stillman from the 1840s into the 1920s, a fascinating period um, overall. Um, we, we suspect that this was painted in Italy uh, in the late 1880s. Um, I'll underscore the very interesting materials of which it's made, watercolor, gouache, likely water glass, an unusual material that we'll touch on later. Um, it's on paper that had been pre-stretched onto wood panel. That's interesting. That will come up. And notice the size as well. It's fairly substantial in effect. Um, not tiny, but certainly not enormous either. And also finally, notice the credit line. This came down to us through the bequest of Susan Norton in 1990. We'll hear more about the Norton family shortly. Now, my thankless job is to try and summarize in two minutes the rather complex history of the Pre-Raphaelite movement, but I'm gonna try because the phrase Pre-Raphaelite will keep coming up again and again tonight. And I think it's just helpful to lay out what we mean. Um, I'm showing you here three iconic images from the first wave of Pre-Raphaelitism. So let me unpack that if I may. The movement was centered in London, in England, um, although ultimately it proved to be admired worldwide, as we shall find out soon. Uh, we're talking here about the late 1840s, the original Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, they were called, uh, seven men in their very late teens and early 20s. The main three figures were these illustrated here, Rossetti, Hunt, and Millet. Those are the names that are really mattering in this context. Now, these young men were tired of the academic conventions that were well represented by Sir Joshua Reynolds, uh, of the late 18th century. Um, they called him Sir Slashua uh, because of his loose handling and his muddy colors. Um, his successors were promoting that style and these young men were tired of it completely. And I think they rather had a right to be. Instead, they preferred looking at the more, quote, primitive early Italian painters. Uh, we're talking 1300s, 1400s, uh, for what they perceived 
as emotional authenticity and technical directness. No tricks, all heart. Um, and that was very important to them. So they pursued tight, meticulous details, bright jewel-like colors that were newly available to artists at this time. And you see here exactly what I'm talking about, especially in the picture at the center. Uh, look at all those colors of the rainbow represented in one canvas. Now, these images, as you can see, are emotionally intense, sometimes even sexy. They're narratives from the Bible, history, legend, modern life, romantic literature, including Shakespeare. Um, this kind of work got strong pushback from most conventional critics, including Charles Dickens in the late 1840s and early 1850s. But fortunately, these young men found a powerful champion in the critic John Ruskin, who was only a decade older, and he got them to the next level of acceptance. And that's a good thing. Now, the title of our talk today is including the word stunner. And you may wonder, well, what's that all about? Well, stunner is a phrase developed by uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti to describe eye-catching women. And he especially liked the look of Elizabeth Siddle, who was an artist, a model, uh, originally uh, working in a hat shop. Uh, and we see her depicted here twice, on the far left as the Virgin Mary and on the far right as Ophelia. She posed for the various artists. Uh, and as I said, Rossetti eventually married her. Um, please note her pale skin, her flowing red hair, the slender neck, limbs, fingers. That's a type, a kind of convention that these young men pursued in many cases. Um, and this was very different from the brown hair that was pulled back tightly that most women wore at that time in the 1840s. And this look that the pre-Raphaelites developed remained very fashionable well through the rest of the 19th century. Now, two other names that might come up uh, would be um, the notion of Italian Renaissance portraiture. Um, on the left, you see a quintessential example of a portrait that would be much admired by these artists uh, of the mid 19th century. Um, and on the right, you're gonna hear the name Ford Maddox Brown. He was slightly older than these young men, but he was very much a soulmate and an encouragement to them. And in fact, we're gonna hear about him in relation to Marie Stillman. Uh, it's interesting to me how this uh, movement was so diverse in its um, influences, looking at old art, uh, and by the way, I should stress, pre-Raphael, before Raphael. That's the look they wanted, not the look of Raphael who had been, in their opinion, abused, uh, had been sort of a great master, but then copied relentlessly to the point where it became boring and dull and, and Sir Slashua-ish. Uh, they wanted this beautiful image on the, on the left, which is so much tighter and more honest in in their opinion. On the right, you see a, a, a modern life moment. Uh, and it's interesting that these young men would look in both directions, past and present. Now, the later phase of paraphletism, the second phase, you might say, uh, began in the 1850s, and it really took hold in the 1860s. And that's when Marie Stillman was emerging in London, in the middle of this art world. Um, I'm showing you here um, uh, examples of how Rossetti uh, tra transformed his style. You see here on the left, an image that's very, very different. And on the right, one of his protégés, Frederick Sands. Um, the fact is that um, this look um, was so much more uh, ethereal, um, more voluptuous in some cases, more sumptuous fabrics and decors, more painterly handling, and a shift in interest away from the primitives toward other periods of the Italian Renaissance. Now, I should point out that um, Rossetti mentored two really important artists, William Morris, many of us know his designs today, and also Edward Burne Jones. And the fact is that Rossetti was ultimately having an affair with Jane Morris. Uh, she is represented by the type on the right. That is not her modeling, but it's her dark black hair and her pale skin. Burne Jones is a key figure in this story. I'll finish here by showing you two masterpieces by him. Uh, he was very influential on Marie Stillman, to be sure. Um, I would stress, by the way, the scrolling dense foliage that you see in both of these pictures. Flowers and plants were very important to this generation, including Stillman. And also, please notice the classical frieze on the architecture beyond, on the right-hand side. Uh, the legacy of ancient Greece and Rome was really, really important to this crowd. And of course, a Stillman taps into that too. Finally, let me point out the female type. It has evolved a little here. Look at the face on the right. Uh, the red hair, the pale face, that leads so neatly to something like Marie Stillman's Hera. I'm not saying it is in any way derivative, but there is a link to be sure. Now I'm gonna finish on an image or two of Stillman herself and ask our guests to talk a bit 
about this artist and her amazing life. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Tell us more, of course. So I'll, I'll start and then Kristen, you're just gonna chime in there. Absolutely. So Marie Stillman was one of a small number of professional female artists working in the second half of the 19th century. Um, she was a really important presence in the Victorian art world, highly unusual for a woman to have achieved that status. Um, and her, she was particularly influenced by members of the Pre-Raphaelite circle. And um, I'll just let Kristen kind of take over here for a minute. Sure. So. Um... You know, Marie was, I think, privileged in many ways. Her father was the Greek consul general in London. He was surrounded by and welcomed artists and intellectuals into their home. Um, and he, it, was a, it was a home that really valued um, education and accomplishment. The, the two sisters, Christine and Marie, were both extremely well-educated. Um, including in the arts, which was, of course, viewed as a very important accomplishment for young women at the time. Marie was also um, legendary as a, a stunning woman. Uh, she was over six feet tall. Um, she was incredibly beautiful. There are all these marvelous stories of when Marie was sort of discovered by some of these artists when she arrived at a party um, that all these artists just sort of burned to paint her. Um, so she, her own interest in art um, developed quite early. She was surrounded by, by the arts at all times. And when she determined that she wanted to take a more serious approach to studying painting herself, um, she was already in that circle. And Ford Maddox Brown, as Peter mentioned before, um, was uh, commissioned then to be her private tutor, which for, uh, for a woman to have private uh, instruction in painting, of course, was a real privilege. And um, she was also a model. And uh, so modeling for many of those pre-Raphaelite artists we know, including Rossetti and, and many others, she also had the opportunity, along with her sister, um, through modeling, to get to know these artists, to watch them work, and to learn and understand their process. So she was in those circles. Yeah, so this is a portrait of Marie by her teacher, Ford Maddox Brown. And um, there is a, an interesting, there's a um, the painting you see on the left, maybe one of Marie's. So she's kind of being caught at a moment, maybe, that she's considering what she's been working on, perhaps in the studio of Ford Maddox Brown. And it was through Brown that more relationships developed with other artists. And um, I think that was a huge advantage that um, she had over, over many. She painted next to uh, Ford Maddox Brown's daughters um, and uh, who were also um, young and burgeoning artists. I just say, you know, she was definitely um, had an edge by um, having the wealth uh, um, behind her to be able to train um, with uh, an artist uh, privately. There was not much alternative schooling for women artists at the time. Um, but at the same time, her social position was, could be a little dis of a disadvantage. So for instance, um, one of the first patrons to approach her to ask um, if he could buy one of her paintings her father stepped in and said no, because it wasn't right for an upper middle class woman to be taking money for anything. That was just kind of a social um, restriction for women at the time. That she should gift it, you yeah. know, at a moment when she's, her talent is, is burgeoning, she's surrounded by these um, amazing artists who are showing their work and selling their work. Um, and for her to navigate her social position and her desire to be taken seriously as an artist um, it was really quite remarkable and it's something she tackled very early on. I think she was also um, known as quite a serious intellectual, mm -hmm. someone who had a deep um, appreciation for poetry, uh, which ultimately 
um, really cemented a deep and lasting friendship with Rossetti, who of course was both a painter and a poet. And they had this shared love of Dante, for example, that continued in correspondence for, for decades. Um, so she was really a person who um, in many ways was ahead of her time. And um, eventually, um, in, in pretty short order here, um, she sort of busted out of, of the cage that she found herself in, the, the restrictions of being sort of a society lady, um, not just through her desire to be a successful artist, but uh, she was also introduced to William James Stillman in um, late 1869, uh, 1870, um, and they fell madly in love. Uh, this is uh, this is a man dad was not so excited about. He approved of him because, of course, he had both uh, been a journalist covering the, the Cretan uprising. Um, so he was welcomed uh, in the Greek community in London with artists, writers. Um, but in terms of being the right match for his daughter, he definitely did not think that was an appropriate match. This is a, a man more than 20 years her senior. Um, he had three children. Um, his wife had tragically um, died by suicide um, in the years before. So he was a widower with three children, not a penny in his bank account, um, but a talented photojournalist and, and man about town. And her, the artists in her life supported this match and helped, helped the match along as best they could. They're in fact marvelous letters. Um, written uh, from her father to Ford Maddox Brown, entreating him to please intercede and to, you know, let her know this is a terrible match, her life is going down the drain, etc. Um, also letters to Rossetti, um, who he flatters and cajoles in these letters by saying, you know, I, I once dreamt my daughter would be with you, you're such a, mar you know, the king of poetry, etc. Um, but defying all of that, this was really a love match, uh, they married in 1871. Their first child together, their first natural child was born in 1872. And this marriage completely transformed her life for, for better and in some ways, you know, in a, in a disadvantageous disadvantage, way. Yeah. So, um, Margaret and Kristen, when we talked about this uh, earlier this week and um, Stillman's name came up, both of you growled a little bit. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, it, it seems to me that you're saying all the all the nicest things as possible about him, but in the end, I think you're not convinced that it was the best marriage in the world for her. Well, there's no no you know arguing that she's just you know about to just burst onto the scene in terms of her career, and all of a sudden she's taking care of three children. Are you <laughs> kidding me? Um, but there are some things that, that William did. For, it was an escaper. It's, it's just as Kristen said, it's the way she got out of that kind of um, slightly confining Victorian social circle. And in fact, the first thing they did upon marriage was to travel to the U.S. Stillman was American. And it was there that she began making contacts and not just people, but also um, exhibition spaces. And she managed to have a career of an exhibiting career on two continents simultaneously. Um, so, so there was an upside um, to, to, to marriage to Stillman. Um, I'm not sure it, <laughs> it overruled. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think Margaret and I are both a little torn on this because, you know, obviously it's one, you know, she, it was truly a love match. She would not have defied her parents um, and been, you know, turned away, penniless, et cetera, unless it was truly love. And, and we all, we're all for true love. That's great. Um, and eventually, of course, the, it, it caused stress in the family, you know, really forever. But there was reconciliation and, and they did, you know, still see one another um, later. But there's no denying that this was a very intelligent, resourceful, talented woman who made it work anyway, despite the, the challenges. Um, they ultimately went um, for his work to live in Italy. They spent you know, much of the 1870s and 1880s living either in Florence or in Rome. Um, for an artist of her skill and intellect, 
what a marvelous place to be, uh, particularly a lot of expats from London who are working in Italy at the time. And by this time, she she's not only, um, of course, participating in raising William's children, but she and William have three children of their own. So this is a this is really a working mom. This is something that many of us can probably relate to, that she has her own passions. She um, rents a studio in Italy. She continues to work. And as Margaret has said, she's exhibiting, uh, she's sending pictures not just to London, but also to the U.S. Um, and she's deeply interested, as her letters co convey, she's deeply interested in being not just artistically and critically successful, but commercially successful. Um, knowing that her ability to sell these pictures um, helps her family financially, which was important. And she made conscious decisions in the subject matter she chose, the, even the size of the pictures, knowing that the larger pictures weren't selling, so she moved to a smaller format. Um, she was very interested in being commercial while raising these amazing daughters, traveling, um, William is, is away much of the time as a correspondent and, and photojournalist. So she's really holding it all together for the family and doing a marvelous job while keeping up incredible relationships and correspondences and painting and doing it all. Yeah, a couple um, things just to add there, Kristen. I would suggest that Florence, which is where they went in the 1870s um, for the first Italian sojourn, um, I would suggest that really, really changed her style. And in fact, the influence of Italian Renaissance art, particular Florentine art is what is what really kind of helped her to develop her mature style. The other thing I would just say, getting back to, because as you said, so now she's in Florence, she has children from two different you know, families, her own and his. And so Rossetti wrote a letter um, to, uh, someone else and said, I suspect the painting goes on over the baby's head. So, I mean, she was determined. I mean, there's no question about it. Absolutely. And you Love think it. of the, you know, one of the, um, one of the critics of the time described her work as being this um, marvelous combination of Ford Maddox Brown's um, compositional style. You know, Ford Maddox Brown was known for having a um, you know, quite strict academic type training. Uh, those who studied with him wrote frequently about um, you know, composition and line and, and the draftsmanship so important to Brown. But her natural inclination and her poetic temperament, um, I think drew her very closely to Rossetti's style. So that time in Florence became a moment that critics later wrote, it's as if you're you know, looking at a brown as translated by Rossetti or something like that, you know, that there's a, and it's not meant to, as a comment on her work being at all derivative, but she is, as her own style emerges, she's really absorbing what's around her. She's absorbing this Italian history. She, we, you can imagine she's in galleries, she's in studios, she's looking at other artists' work. Um, and she's really grappling with the two major artistic, two or three major artistic influences on her own work. And we see that come through. These Italian pictures, um, including Hera, which we'll talk about this evening, really shows that influence of being in Italy and absorbing the influences all around her. Yeah, so let's talk about Hera. Can Absolutely. You yeah. <laughs> what a great segue. <laughs> so, so Kristen, um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about, because it's actually, you were the one who I, I identified this, this portrait, and I should just say that one of the issues with many women artists, but Marie in particular, is that um, we have very little um, primary documentation of, of what she did, and Kristen is responsible for um, gathering all that together um, in her master's thesis, which is still just fantastic and useful and fabulous. So, Thank you. Yeah. Yes, it is. This is, um, you know, it, it's interesting. When I did my research on Stillman, um, you know, it was very much on the shoulders of some scholars who were really the first ones to start looking at the female pre-Raphaelites. Um, people like Pamela Garish Nunn and, and Jan Marsh um, were sort of heroes. Uh, and in fact, Dr. Marsh was so kind when, you know, in the 90s when I was in London, working on the research for, um, for, this, for this thesis. She was so kind to share what notes she had and, and point me in the right direction. But 
there are so few, um, the professional artists, uh, the professional women artists, um, there's so few ways for us to track the, the completion of their of, you know, when we think about um, Marie Stillman, for example, we know she was prolific. We know she painted constantly. Um, we know that she sold and exhibited paintings both in the US and in London. If they were exhibited, um, I'll tell you, I was the one sitting in the libraries in London going through every exhibition record for everything that happened in any major gallery in London for about three or four decades looking for her name. And that's how the thesis, um, that's how that checklist was developed. So it's a, quite a manual process because, but if it wasn't exhibited or if it wasn't later sold at auction or found its way into a, a public collection, we don't have record of it. And Hera that we're, we're looking at here on the right is a good example of that. Um, in all of the exhibition records that, uh, you know, from the second half of the 19th century into the early 20th century, there's nothing that even descriptively matches what this picture is. So it's very likely um, that this was purchased and remained in private hands through the generations until it came to a public collection um, as it has. So a work like this, um, Peter, reached out to me to, you know, to say, you know, what do you, what do you know about this one? And this is one of those times when it's a discovery. It's very exciting. And for art historians, as we, um, as we look at works and people like Margareta and myself and, and probably many more around the world by now feel so connected to Marie Stillman that we recognize her hand. We, you know, we understand that this is one of her works. This one is, is perhaps a little easier to identify. It's very much in keeping with her works from the late 1880s uh, when she's working in Italy. Of course, her monogram um, is present on this one. She doesn't sign with a monogram every time, but on this one, there is a monogram which made it quite easy to authenticate as a Stillman. But this work, um, because we don't have what her original title was, for example. We don't have an exhibition record. Um, critics didn't write about it at the time. Um, we're left to read this picture. And we know that um, Stillman, like so many of the pre-Raphaelite artists, um, leave lots of clues in their, in their pictures. Floral symbolism, the language of flowers um, is something they're all quite fluent in the language of flowers. Um, and we know that she was very much influenced by this Italian Renaissance portrait tradition um, in which the sitter will have attributes or be surrounded by, um, you know, the, the setting they find themselves in, the attributes they may be carrying, um, give us clues to the sitter's identity. So in this case, um, my reading of this picture um, with a young woman holding a pomegranate and a peacock feather. Um, as, as we'll talk about, I'm, I'm sure, peacock feathers were sort of a favorite trope. Um, Marie used peacock feathers as um, attributes or props in, in several pictures. But in this case, um, I identified this, this image as being of Hera, um, as Peter mentioned, Zeus's wife. Um, because the pomegranate and the peacock feather were, are both attributes that are associated with that Greek goddess. Um, although in it, her time in Italy, she had started moving away from Greek subjects um, and more into literary subjects, um, I still think this is a, a good reading of this picture. The, the model is very likely to be her daughter, Effie, who was a teenager by this time. Um, she looks remarkably like Effie, and, and we'll show you some Im images of, of Effie uh, later in this presentation. But I think this is very likely to be um, an image of Hera, possibly a celebration of marriage and of love. Hera, uh, being the wife of Zeus, um, is often associated with brides, with marriage, with happy marriage in particular. Perhaps this was a wedding gift for someone, perhaps it was a celebration of her own marriage. She certainly did that um, and was self-referential and, and biographical in some of her works. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot to unpack in a beautiful picture like this because I hadn't seen it before and it certainly is hers. Well, and, and just to, to draw the circle, 
if I may, um, I had contacted Margareta for guidance, and it was Margareta who steered me to Kristen. Uh, the idea being that, you know, together, a community of scholars can solve a problem. And we're so grateful to both of you. Uh, and in fact, Kristen comments at length on our website about this picture. So those who want to learn more can do that in a, a video presentation that's on the site. So um, this is, um, as you mentioned before, very much a community that is growing and passionate. Uh, if I may advance uh, to the next slide, we have another uh, image um, that is a comparative, I suppose. So this is Effie. Um, this is one of Marie and William's ch children. Um, and that's, we're just showing that because there has been some suggestion that Effie was the sitter for this. Her, her girls and her stepdaughters um, pose for her um, all the time because that was the way it worked. They were at hand. Um, yeah. And if you go to the next slide, yeah. um, Peter, if you could, these are the two Stillman girls, um, Lisa and Bella. And there's some similarity there in terms of facial characteristics. They could also have been the sitters um, for Hera. Um, and then I think in the next slide, um, we just wanted to show, um, this is a documented painting on the left at the Ashmolean, Cloister Lilies, and uh, the blow up, the detail is of her signature, which is actually a, a monogram. It's very similar to the way Dante Gabriel Rossetti signed his painting. So definitely, this is a kind of a, a tradition amongst the Pre-Raphaelite circle. And then in the upper, um, in the middle of the detail in the upper register is the signature for the Hera, which you see in the painting um, just uh, up a bit in the lower left. So all of these factors go into trying to identify um, a, a painting that is relatively undocumented. Um, Peter's going to talk a little later about um, the uh, provenance of this painting, how it came to um, um, to the collection, and that is another um, way that we kind of double check to to confirm the authorship or the potential authorship um, of a work of art. And then um, because Marie worked in a really unusual combination of um, media in her painting, actually very similar to um, the combination that Edward Byrne Jones used, um, particularly later, um, uh, it's, that's another way. So this is, um, it's a combination, it's a watercolor, but at least to many, when you look at her paintings at first, you think, Oh, it's an oil painting because there's mm -hmm. such depth and there's such. Um, it's not. It's it's um, not translucent like a like a watercolor. It's more opaque, and that's because of this kind of combination of watercolor and uh, gouache, which is a kind of a mixture of gum arabic, which is a thickener, and a, um, so on, and water glass, which was a very um, a medium that was often employed um, in these kind of. Um, more opaque uh, watercolor, um, this opaque watercolor technique. And so the fact, and, and then finally, um, the, the painting is done on a piece of paper that's been laid on a board. And um, as we know from the records of a very famous artist supply shop, um, these were, were the kind of surfaces um, that Marie purchased pre-laid. Um, pre uh, and then she could paint right on uh, right on the paper that was on the board. So all of these things, um, which of course N New England was able to find out in, in looking at this painting in a conservator's studio, um, kind of led to this this final decision uh, about the authorship of this work. I think there's you know two things I would just add to that. The first is, can we all just take a moment and recognize how unforgiving the watercolor medium is? So the technical virtuosity of this artist um, who continued trying and working and working and working for years, you know, hats off. I mean, this is a, this is a beautiful work on paper um, in a really unforgiving medium. And, um, and it's just, it's spectacular. The other thing in terms of um, looking at authorship and, and understanding sort of the, the work at large, um, we're in a period where she did a lot of these half-length images of women 
um, often with Italianate um, landscape or architecture in the middle ground and in the background. So what you see it, uh, in Hera, um, I think if we could advance to the next slide, I think there's um, one of my favorites is coming up, but it's the same kind of, um, it's the same kind of, of composition where you have this half length uh, image of a woman, she's holding attributes in her hands, there's foliage, I, you know, uh, and, and, and of course on the left, the Madonna Pietra um, degli Scorvigni is um, a very complex, very dense uh, work. It's, it's more dense than, than many of her works. Um, and that's a picture, by the way, that was purchased by the Walker Out, uh, Art Gallery in Liverpool in 1884 when she was living. So she had the pleasure of knowing that one of her works was already in a public collection during her life, which is really remarkable. But when you look at the composition of several of these um, sort of Italianate Renaissance portrait inspired works, they do have very similar compositions. And that was another uh, pointer for us for the Hera. Absolutely. And I think the next slide is another example um, uh, of one of these Italian inspired works. Um, this one entitled Love's Messenger, also from the 1880s. Um, I think very much like the work of Leonardo da Vinci as the previous um, painting we looked at, um, but also one in which there's a little bit of a narrative there based on the various um, details which he's included. Um, it's called Love's Messenger. There's a dove. Um, he has a string that's been tied to his um, claw. Uh, and uh, clearly there is some kind of a message uh, that he brought to her and she's attracted him by the corn um, that she holds in her palm. And then just in case you weren't totally clear on what the contents of that message might be, it turns out she's working on an embroidery um, that features Cupid, um, so and thereby the title of the painting. And then in the background, this just stunningly beautiful Italianate landscape. Um, yeah. Um, and then if we just advance to the next slide, we can go to a landscape which is a little more similar in kind of color and feel um, to what's going on in the Hera. This picture, I have to say, I think is just one of my favorites. The Childhood of St. Cecilia um, is a really large format. Um, it's, a, it's one of her large works. Um, this we know is Effie as a model. This is the older, uh, the eldest of the daughters. Um, and this is another example where we see a lot of floral symbolism. She's telling us, she's telling us who, uh, you know, who the saint is through some of these attributes, both the floral, um, the musical instrument, of course, associated with, with St. Cecilia. But this is another moment that I would, uh, I would argue, and, and I have argued, um, is another sort of biographical or self-referential work, because I believe that the, um, the sort of, angelic presence uh, with St. Cecilia is the artist herself, is Marie Stillman in a self-portrait. Um, so in addition to, as she would have, as she wrote at the time, trying to appeal to Catholic patrons with images of saints or um, more religious uh, type of iconography, um, she's also painting a, a portrait of a loving mother and daughter here. So this is meant to be I think commercially very attractive, although it was in a large format, which she later decided maybe smaller formats sell easier. Um, but I think this is another really beautiful image where she is um, putting in her own messages, her own style, her own biography into and sort of overlaying it on um, either biblical, mythological or literary themes. And Kristen, there is a photograph of this painting on an easel in her studio in Rome, which to me is just like, I mean, there's I so few photographs of her. So this is yeah. just, you know, that's the cat's meow. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so, and then I think the next slide is just yeah. to give you a sense, when she was in Rome, she studied with an Italian artist who was also quite popular in the UK and exhibited there, whose name was um, Giovanni Costa. And um, this is just a stellar landscape that has kind of a little bit of Costa in it, but more, um, it's so pre raphaelite in its just um, precision of detail. And um, in the foreground, the, the flowers are, are 
practically identifiable they are painted with such technical um, brilliancy and again as Kristen said this is an unforgiving medium so all the more oh, amazing yeah <laughs> we're Thank fans you. You can uh, tell. Well, I can tell uh, fans <laughs> all around <laughs> now I'll, I'll just jump if I may to the back of our painting uh, to show you a label that appears on it um, this is intriguing in the sense that um, it's an important gallery in Philadelphia uh, from the late 19th century. Uh, and it reminds us of that close connection that Marie had with the United States, not only through her husband and his family, uh, he being from uh, New England, by the way, uh, but also through her own energy. I love the picture that you painted for us of her not only painting and raising children, but also conducting a business career, writing letters and sending works of art back to England or America. Um, that's intriguing. Uh, this, um, it, it's, it's hard for us to know exactly where in the picture's history this label fits in, but we can begin to dig perhaps a little in the future. Uh, I'm just going to ask our guests to talk a bit about the relationship with America, uh, beginning uh, in particular, if I understand correctly, 1871, as the couple were visiting the United States to see William's family. Yes. Right, so so 1871, she comes to America for the first time. Um, William introduces her to, you know, very much the kind of um, Boston um, artistic milieu. Um, she meets, among others, um, Charles Elliot Norton, um, yeah. from whose family this painting came down to historic New England. Um, and her family, her children become very good friends with his children. Um, they also meet um, Richard Watson Gilder and his wife, who's also an artist, and those children um, spend time together. And in fact, Lisa Stillman um, considered herself, I think, um, an American. There's a lovely quote where she's writing after returning to London from being in America and says, you know, I do hope I may return soon to my own country. You, you know, so, so really America is it, a very interesting dichotomy. And then, and then of course, Marie's son, Michael, um, became an architect, worked for the for firm of McKim, Mead and White and settled in America and he didn't go back. Um, yeah. And, and in fact, right, so this is, um, it's a, we don't have the original drawing, sadly, but it's a, an image taken at the time um, of uh, Mrs. Gilder with one of their, one of their children. And, and, and uh, I should say that almost all of the Stillman children were, were artists in one form or another. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I may, if, if it's all right, just jump ahead to talk a bit briefly about two other works of art in the exhibition on view at Eustace Estate, which are related to the Norton family and that shed light on the Stillman. Uh, this is a marvelous portrait of Sarah Norton, nicknamed Sally, uh, Charles Elliot Norton's daughter, one of them. Uh, this is painted by, as you can see, Burne Jones. Uh, so there again, we have this circle of friendship. Uh, it's a fact that uh, the Nortons and the Burne Joneses were close. This picture also came down through uh, the generosity of Susan Norton. Uh, Charles Elliot Norton, uh, his granddaughter. Um, and I'll just jump ahead to a marvelous document uh, that we have here um, on the left. Um, this is an image showing Sally and Lily Norton with Margaret Byrne Jones, the daughter of so this idea of um, uh, the next generation down. It's true with the Byrne Joneses as much as it is uh, with the Nortons um, and, and the Stillmans. Um, on the right, I show you here Byrne Jones and William Morris. I mentioned them before as being mentored by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and they certainly were uh, intimates of Charles Elliot Norton and his family. Um, and then finally, another great Norton family picture in our Mancini, based in Italy, but very well known to uh, elite uh, sitters uh, in England and, and um, the United States. Um, this is Richard Norton, uh, Sally's brother, uh, who was head of the American School of Classical Studies in Rome, and he sat for Mancini in Rome. Um, I'm just going to return, if I may, to this image. I'll mention that actually in the collection of Historic New England uh, is an undated bust-length portrait of Sally Norton drawn in pencil by Miss Lisa Stillman, um, and that seems to be yet another clue of this intimacy 
uh, among the families. Uh, it's intriguing and it really does deserve more research. Actually, at least it deserves more research. So does Effie. Yes. But, yeah. And yes. Effie was a sculptor, I think. She was, and there's a sculptor, yeah. by, sculptor by her on the parkway in front of the art museum. Oh, that's right. Uh, great. Nancy. So, yeah, so, so um, Kristen and Margareta, we're, we're winding down now. Um, and if people have questions, I remind you to put them in the Q&A in the bottom of your screen, most of you. Uh, those of you might have it at the top. Um, but I wanted to ask you your thoughts about what's going on with Stillman's post-life career. Um, do you feel like um, she's gaining? Um, acceptance. Uh, it seems like given her incredible talent, she's not as well known as one might expect. Uh, do you think that's true and do you think it's changing? I think it's definitely changing, but it's go ahead, Margareta. Yeah, I mean, I mean, scholars like Jan Marsh and Pam Nunn, you know, when was that? Like 25 years ago when they were starting? More than that. I mean, I was reading their books in the, you know, late 80s, early 90s. So, and, and since then, it's only gained momentum. I mean, because the kind of the women were left out of the whole discussion of, of Victorian art, most mm -hmm. arts, Victorian as well. Um, and it's really interesting and wonderful for you all to have this painting in your exhibition, because just last year, pre-pandemic, um, was this huge show uh, at the National Portrait Gallery in London called Pre-Raphaelite Sisters that was entirely focused on women in the Pre-Raphaelite movement. So we've kind of come a very long way. Uh, yeah. I think there was, you know, for a long time, um, this idea of, you know, women, it was more of a hobby or it was an accomplishment or um, something like that. I think women being taken seriously as artists as they wished to be um, is not something that we could find room for somehow in the canon until you know the last few decades. Um, Marie Stillman, um, you know, her obituary is all about how beautiful she was, and that she was a, you know, that she was a model, and she was one of the stunners, and she was part of the circle of men. And then it goes on to talk about the men. Um, you know, I think it's she was this you know remarkable sort of force of nature. But she, there's another reason that I think. Um, her work has not um, come to light perhaps as easily, and that is she was an intensely private person. And, um, you know, there, there's a letter I've, that I uncovered that she wrote to one of Ford Maddox Brown's daughters that survives, in which she said um, she regrets to tell her that she has no letters from her father because she's made it a practice since very young to burn every letter she receives because these letters can be misinterpreted and misconstrued um, after someone's death. And she, she vowed never to write about her friends. She was you know, very protective of all of the artists in this circle. Um, and she was protective herself. She was known as, um, she was sort of referred to as this mysterious and aloof and elegant um, sort of distant figure, although, you know, incredible personal style and incredible charisma, um, but she is not a person who is, you know, self-promoting. Um, she was actually quite self-effacing, certainly, you know, in the early years of her exhibition history. Um, and I think without that sort of driving force, um, which would not have been appropriate or at all ladylike at the time, um, we were learning more as time marches on because it's not something that would have happened at, at the time. Yeah, and ironically, her business acumen did her in because almost all of her work was sold to private collectors. And of course, not being in public collections really, you know, kind of hides a, a body of work and indeed. Mm -hmm. having... That's right. <laughs> the wonderful thing about that, though, ever the optimist I am, um, is that many of her works that we don't necessarily know about yet are still in private hands and um, there are still discoveries to be made, which is, which is an exciting prospect. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Peter, do you want to uh, move on to the next slide? So yes. um, this is a reminder to those of you who are listening that 
all of the information about the exhibition, uh, article stories and the paintings in the exhibition uh, is available to you on the web. Uh, there's a quite detailed website for the exhibition that includes, for instance, Kristen's discussion about uh, the Stillman on video um, and others similar things for the uh, whole exhibition. So we hope you'll visit it. Um, and on the next slide, um, you can see the, the main page of the website here. Uh, right. And there are also thematic buttons so that you can move around the exhibition thematically. Um, and I will um, boast actually about one of the most recent additions to the website. And you can see it on this slide. Um, where it offers a 360 degree tour of Eustis. So if you were, if this were live, you would press that button and be able to walk around at your leisure on the first floor of the Eustis house, then walk up the stairs to the galleries, walk into the galleries virtually and look at each painting. Um, and I encourage you if you're interested to do so. Um, I think that uh, I want you to know about another program that will be following this one and uh, later in March. Um, and this is Erica Herschler from the MFA Boston, who has come to see the exhibition with me and has had a chance to um, think comparatively about some of the paintings in their uh, collection that uh, relate to some of the ones that are in ours. And, It'll be fun to talk with her about what she saw in the exhibition. Um, now that said, we have a number of questions um, and I will be happy to pass them along. Um, I have a uh, question saying that um, from the conservator who was the woman who worked on the piece for us, uh, she's a paper conservator um, she says it was truly a highlight of her recent professional career to work on this, both in terms of the challenges it presented and the Stillman's incredible handling of the media. Mm -hmm. Finding all this new information about Stillman and this piece in particular, so interesting. If anyone has questions about the conservation treatment, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A um, and uh, we'll pass them along. Um, That's great. Thank you, thank you. Another uh, question is about Stillman's landscape watercolor that we showed at the end. And the question is, uh, how large is that watercolor? Mm -hmm. it, I don't know the answer to that one. Maybe Margaret knows. Is, um, <laughs> <laughs> the size of my screen. <laughs> um, I would say it's about two feet across. Okay. Um, uh, the one in the Morgan, Ponte Namenteno. Yeah, that, that, it's about two feet across. Um, it's, it's lovely. And it's much more finished than many of her landscapes, which is another reason why it stands out particularly, which suggests it was an exhibition piece, you know? Yeah. Um, so a series of questions, um, which uh, are, um, did, were there in her lifetime collectors who were specifically interested in her art? Did she have particular people that she returned to with her pieces? Yes, the, uh, the answer absolutely is yes. And Margareta, um, is, is definitely the right person to ask about this because one of the most important collections of Pre-Raphaelite art in the United States um, is at her museum, the Delaware Art Museum, a place that I hold in, with great, great affection. Um, and the collector um, whose collection is the basis of that um, wonderful place is, uh, is someone who bought a bunch of Marie Stillman pictures. So Margareta, I think, should, should address that one. Yeah, so Samuel Bancroft, it is his collection that is at Delaware um, with some additions over time. And uh, there's a wonderful correspondence between he and Marie. Um, he was also integral in getting um, Effie involved in the sculpture commission on the parkway outside of the museum. Um, interestingly, 
it's great that we have all the Bancroft record and archive because it was very difficult to ferret out um, and we were only successful in a few cases, other American private collectors who bought her work. Um, so, so again, it would have helped if we had Marie's letters. Um, <laughs> so this is just one of the many um, roadblocks and frustrations um, in, in doing art historical work. Uh, I was flashing, if I may interrupt, just to say this beautiful book still available uh, to purchase uh, Poetry and Beauty uh, is the result of Margareta and Jan Marsh's hard work on the exhibition in 2015 at the Delaware Art Museum. So um, I'm sorry, I'm holding it crooked. Um, please do consider getting a copy if you'd like to know a lot more about Stillman. And Peter, maybe we've got a few more questions. Maybe if you want to back up and show us a lovely um, Stillman image so that we of course. can enjoy that as we're Absolutely. going forward. <laughs> Um, yes. One of the questions that uh, came along, and, and I have my own thoughts about this, but I'll be interested in yours, uh, is did she ever work in oil? Did she work in what? Oil. Oil. Not that I'm aware of, Margarita, do you? Do you know? Now, we could never find anything in mm -hmm. oil. I think a lot, some of the documentation early on, I'm talking secondary, not, you know, not primary, um, suggests or describes her work in oil. And I think it's just, um, um, uh, well, uh, uh, an error and, and maybe- Maybe, just, maybe a misunderstanding of the, of yeah, the yeah. heavy watercolor. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not aware of any. I know that there are extant charcoal drawings um, that she did, she did sketch, she did, you know, there, there are drawings out there. Um, many of whom, many of them are, you know, probably in private collections, but I'm not aware of any of any serious oil. And we oil. looked hard because we really wanted to put that one to bed, you know. Right, right. So yeah. I, I'm sure that you all know that um, I think feminist art historians talk a fair bit about the materials that women artists work with, and, and a lot of them don't work in oil. And whether that has something to do with their family situation. Um, that it's uh, harder to walk away from and do in fits and starts as you would if you have a young child. Um, do you think that could be part of it? I've always thought that, yeah, just sheer, you know, lo logistics. Right. right. Takes longer to dry, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Smells. Um, it. Yeah. it smells, that's true. Uh, let's see, a, uh, a comment about uh, an exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery three years ago um, in London, the consensus being that women ended up um, badly, uh, although I'm not exactly sure what this uh, comment is trying to say, but that the implication of the exhibition might have been that, that women did not do as well in some format, um, and perhaps uh, the commenter might want to explain that a little bit. Um, another question about uh, the peacock feathers, what did they symbolize? So um, the peacock feather um, carries various uh, symbolism, but the, the most common um, is as an attribute uh, of Hera. It's also, it can um, indicate pride, um, but that's not typically how the Pre-Raphaelites used um, the peacock feather. There's an exoticism about it. Um, there's beautiful color. There's technical virtuosity involved in it. So it's, um, you know, something that I think Marie must have had some peacock feathers around because it does turn up um, in several of her several of her works, and I'm always interested. Um, you know, the kind of props that move from one painting to another. Um, the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, where I'm the director, we, we recently purchased um, a beautiful work by um, Spencer Stanhope that includes as a prop, a chair that he borrowed from, I think it was Burne Jones, you know, that, that's also visible in other paintings. And so, um, you know, I do love seeing how some of these, um, 
some of these images sort of crop up in various places and you think, oh, she needed a, she needed something to hold or, you know, in the background, there's, you know, this bottle glass, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bottle glass walls that turn up and it must have been in her studio. There must have been some bottle glass windows or something that, um, that made that sort of easy to go for. Just a, just an idea, no proof on that one. The peacock was very much part of the aesthetic movement, I think because of those rich colors. So not only the artists, but the um, people who were feel, filling their interiors were um, mm -hmm. drawn to the peacock. In fact, yeah, Nancy, peacock. and in the, that case, probably with no symbolism whatsoever. Right. Right. Aesthetic appeal. It's beautiful, yeah. I mean, think of Leighton and, you know, right. so many. Leighton, yeah. yeah. Yep. So many examples there. Um, I'll uh, pass along, I think, just a couple more questions. One is, um, did the pre raphaelite sisters have a working or personal relationship? And this is from the conservator who worked on ours. Um, she said at the same time, she had an Evelyn de Morgan in her studio at the same time that Hera was there, and she couldn't help but wonder if they had known each other. There's no evidence that I found about a relationship with um, Evelyn de Morgan. However, um, she was really close with Jane Morris. And in fact, after both their husbands died, spent a great deal of time at Kelmscott. I imagine uh, just these two wonderful women hanging out in the garden at Kelmscott Manor. I mean, you know. Incredible. Yeah. Right. Um, and I would, in terms of the sisterhood in general, you know, that's a phrase that we use to talk about women um, in the Victorian period in the art world. Um, I would say it's more loose than that, but I would also say that given that they were all fighting the same fight in order to attain some kind of professionality at a time when it was very difficult for women, there was at least, you know, loose alliances, you know, and uh, in order to kind of, you know, um, forward everyone so yeah and sort of early on I mean this this may be a little bit more of a stretch but um, Marie did model for John Rodham uh, Spencer Stanhope who was Evelyn de Morgan's uncle so it's possible that you know there's a, a friendship or, or an acquaintanceship um, at the very least there they're you know they're all in the same circles and they have these interests and um, so much is lost from, you know, the destruction of correspondence and, um, and that kind of thing. So there, there may well be um, relationships and cross currents going that, uh, that are lost to, lost to history. And maybe I'll find out what, the more I work on the evening. I know, it's exciting. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'll let you know, Kristen. Report back. <laughs> Report back, please. So two last questions. Do can either of you talk about water glass and how that was used? Our our conservator, if she's still online, might be able to comment um, in the chat. And if I see it pop up, I'll I'll put that in. But I know she's the one who identified for us that there was water glass. In it, it's on the list of things she purchased from Robersons. But I would be so happy if your conservator would speak to that. <laughs> And then, um, I mean, we imagine that this is something that added sort of depth and texture. Right. Um, you know how experimental she was with it. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know much about about that particular um, part of her work or experimentation. That was my understanding as well. Is that that it adds depth and and mm -hmm. um, and a, a certain degree of opaque opacity. That would have been. And in terms of the the number of things and the mixture, the media that she um, put together, that particular uh, mix. I, I, I have always thought just because of her friendship with uh, Burne Jones that she probably learned a great deal of that from him. And finally, the last question is the latest date that she is known to have painted. Oh, so exciting. This was one of the things that came out of the exhibition, which was, so she dies in 1927, but she's in New York in 1919, and she has an exhibition at the Willowbrook Company. So, so she is working quite late, also doing 
interesting things with painted screens, which was very much a part of the aesthetic movement. So, I mean, she's moving with the times, you know, it's just astounding to me. And there are some, there's some wonderful um, letters and remembrances um, from, I think it's a grandson, Margareta, correct me if I have this wrong, but that she was um, doing still lives and that part of his job would be to bring a, a fresh flower each day to his grandmother for that day's you know bouquet that she was working on sort of still one one flower at a time that that precision um, but I think she was painting those screens late in life but she continued um, you know painting beautiful watercolors you know well into her 70s and early 80s. So I have a response from our conservator and by the way I have to say that she did an unbelievable job on this piece which had a split uh the wood had cracked and uh you would not know it and we were just so thrilled with her work yes about it she says i was really struck by the way the layers of the paint layers were opaque yet still transparent enough to allow the underlying layers of paint applied with a tiny brush uh show through she says, my feeling is that it was the addition of the water glass that contributed to this striking effect, which really has to be seen in person to be believed. That's very helpful. On the water glass. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to those of you who have joined us um, for this uh, wonderful conversation. Thank you, Kristen and Margareta. What a joy it's been to hear you both share your obvious passion.